Good morning, everybody. Ali Tahir and I are really honored to chair this symposium on the occasion of AUB 150 years and the inauguration of Fadl Khouri as 16th president of AUB. Uh, we are going to start our symposium uh, with uh, a few introductions that uh, Ali and myself have prepared. Uh, the title of our symposium is Cancer in the Molecular Era. Uh, just a few words because this is a celebratory year. Uh, 2016, AUB has been making history. We heard a lot yesterday about AUB, all AUB making history. Please allow us here to talk about the Faculty of Medicine and the Medical Center. Uh, AUB has provided over the years leadership at AUBMC and in Lebanon uh, AU, at the Faculty of Medicine, other hospitals and universities, government and Ministry of Public Health positions, Pan-Arab and International Society. We also have been providing leadership in the Middle East, United States, and worldwide. You can see here in this picture our students, pictures that we have taken uh, during the celebrations. These are our med four students graduating a couple of years ago, making rounds. Uh, a lot of times people say it takes a long time to do medicine, but believe me, they have fun. We have fun while studying medicine and training. In this hall, we have the uh, our residents graduating and their parents. Here we have our weekly conferences that we hold at AUB, the Medical Grand Rounds, and this is the uh, great uh, MEMA, Middle East Medical Assembly, that Ali Tahir and all the group organized last year. Uh, just a few more words about the achievements of AUB throughout the years. In, in addition to state-of-the-art treatments of cancer patients in Lebanon and the Middle East, we have started subspecialization and multidisciplinary care for our cancer patients. Other departments also are uh, in this. This is uh, our goals over the next uh, few years to have all subspecialization. We have reported excellent outcomes of children with cancer with survival rates 80 to 90 percent. We have patients with blood disorders and uh, hematological malignancies with excellent also survivals. Adult patients with breast cancer and early disease, we have reported uh, 90 percent survival in early disease. We do a lot of outreach work uh, with NGOs and the Ministry of Health, anti-smoking campaigns, breast cancer awareness and early detection. Dr. Khouri spoke yesterday of the importance that he will put in on uh, community work. This is a very important work that we have been doing. We are proud to do it. We hold regular conferences and uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hassan Al-Sulah. Uh, Hassan is the uh, director of the Naive Basil Cancer Institute. I put that in bold, in addition, of course, to his position as chief of staff, director of Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon. Uh, Hassan, uh, as you could uh, read yani in the uh, bios, of course, he has an illustrious career in pediatric hematology, oncology, stem cell transplantation, and medical administration at the executive level. Uh, uh, Hassan uh, has been with us over the years. Uh, we chose uh, those couple of pictures. Here you see all the staff. Everybody loves Hassan Sulah. Hassan uh, always at our conferences, and at his desk he has thousands of files, always, uh, but he gets them done. He is a doer, uh, we all love him, and we would love to hear him. Ali, you want to say a few words? No, I think Naji said, <laughs> presented all the slides. So I would like to welcome Hassan.
Good morning, uh, Sabah al Khair. Members of the AUB Board of Trustees, Dr. Fadl Khouri, our AUB President, Dr. Mohammed Saif, Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs and Global Strategy, distinguished speakers and guests, dear colleagues. On behalf of the AUBMC and the Naif Basil Cancer Institute staff, I would like to welcome you to the Presidential Symposium on Cancer in the Molecular Era, era Promise and Prospects. This symposium will address the most recent advances and innovations in the screening, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of cancer by authorities in the field. As we celebrate the 150th anniversary of AUB and the inauguration of Dr. Fadl Khouri presidency, AUB is making history. And AUBMC is moving forward toward the 2020 vision. As far as the Basile Institute, we are paving the way to become a center of excellence, not only in Lebanon and the Middle East, but hopefully in the very near future internationally. We established a strategic plan in 2013. It started in 2013 and it's been implemented in conjunction with the ongoing plans for AUBMC 2020 vision. This plan includes specific strategic projects. Uh, I don't have a long presentation, but just a few slides, five slides, bear with me, just to tell you what are we doing at the present time for the Basile Institute in order to move forwards to have it a center of excellence worldwide. The strategic plan involved the following strategic projects with a vision to develop world-leading clinical and research programs. We started establishing new services, specifically the cancer control and prevention program looking at personalized and precision medicine. <coughs> As far as accreditation, we just had the JC for stem cell transplantation. They were visiting us, completed the inspection two weeks ago, and we're looking forward to have accreditation by JC within a short time. I can tell you that uh, this will be a major achievement. We will be one out of four or five centers outside Europe and United States accredited for stem cell transplant. There are ongoing efforts to have the oncology accreditation, which will be really unique in the region and internationally outside US and Europe. We're setting our strategic priorities, and during the symposium, you're going to hear Dr. Ali Bazirbashi presenting the research for the Naif Basil Cancer Institute, and Dr. Raya Saab presenting some examples of translational research that we do at the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon. We're working on increasing the capacity and patient access, and I want to focus on patient access because we are working hard to establish, and it's already established, a needy patient fund to support the patients who cannot afford getting care for cancer. And I think this is very critical and we started already with very good funds established to support these patients. Also, as you know, Division 2020 has the planning and commissioning of the ambulatory oncology services in the academic and clinical center and the new cancer hospital. As you know, the building is the plans and the construction are going very well, and I hope by end of 2016, beginning of 2017, we will be able to operate the new building with two floors for oncology as an ambulatory cancer center of excellence, infusion center, clinics, academic, 
and educational facilities. And there are ongoing plans. Dr. Saira and the team are working on having the new medical complex, hopefully by 2020. There will be a cancer hospital as the major part of the new medical complex. Uh, the other strategic project that we did is working on improving efficiency, decision making, and accountability. We established databases for all disease categories with registries, and we are in the process of implementing electronic clinical applications that will support the operation, and definitely looking at performance management and accountability. We're working on recruitment and retention of qualified staff and we already had two new faculty in the last year, and we're hoping to get more in addition to staff in nursing and also uh, clinical associate staffs. We're working on developing partnership, collaboration, and reach out. Uh, as you know, the Kisirwan Medical Center already started, and we are establishing oncology services there and we are working on the design and construction of a new cancer center in Tripoli. We are planning the design and construction of the new cancer center in the south, in Midrar Medical Center. This will take time, maybe up to two years. Also, we are developing and starting collaborations with several regional and international cancer institutes King Hussain Cancer Center, the Winship Cancer Institute, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and MD Anderson. In addition to establishing networks in the region, we already established the Pediatric Oncology, East and Mediterranean Group, and AUBMC, specifically CCL, is the regional office for 80 pediatric cancer centers in 22 countries in the Middle East and in Asia. We're working on establishing a network for adult cancer centers in the Middle East and North Africa region. Also, uh, hopefully soon, we will finish the bylaws for establishing the Naif Basile Prize for Cancer. Uh, definitely, the time will not allow me to go over the key performance indicators showing, uh, with benchmarking, showing what we have achieved so far. However, to conclude, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Ali Tahir and Dr. Uh, Najis Saghir for the excellent organization and preparation for the conference, for the symposium. And I would like to thank the team at the Naif Basile Cancer Center and also the Children Cancer Center of Lebanon. As you know, we have several challenges that will face us. However, we're moving forward uh, in spite of the political, social, and security instability in Lebanon in the region. However, we are determined to move forward, and I think we are on our way to pursue excellence in cancer care. This is the AUB spirit, and we are going to continue to move forward. I hope today's symposium will be informative and productive, as we have the top experts in various fields of oncology addressing the prospects of future of cancer care and prevention. Uh, finally, Congratulations to Dr. Fadl Khouri, and congratulations to all of us for the, for the AUB uh, 150th anniversary, and looking forward for another 150 years of accomplishments, innovation, and history making. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan.
to, uh, to get to meet a leader, one is always lucky. To work with a visionary, also one is honored. To get to work with an achiever, one is always challenged. But to be in a team with a person that have those three talents, God, it's a jackpot. So I would like you all to welcome um, Hamad al -Sayir, Executive Vice President of Medicine and Global Strategy and the Dean of AUB Medical Center. Thank you. So first, uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you my story with Fadl. I didn't know Fadl before. I knew his father. In fact, his father was the reason why I became a nephrologist. I was a medical student. I heard about Fadl, but I didn't know him well. In 2008, the Board of Trustees ran a search for the uh, position of the Vice President and Dean for the Faculty of Medicine, and we were the two finalists. And the people questioned the wisdom of the search committee at that time because they chose me as the uh, person. I got a call from Fadlu at that time, and he said, I could not think of any better person to hold the position of the chair of my father's name. It was a moving moment. So I came here, we put together the 2020 vision, and I asked him to chair the AUBMC advisory board, and he worked with us for the last six years or so. Every time he reminds me, it's one year longer. But anyway, he worked very hard with us to, with a team of people from the US and, and the Middle East, to look at uh, over our shoulders, see what we are doing, review us, and has been extremely helpful. In 2008, the story repeats itself, and the Board of Trustees was searching for a president for AUB, and we both were competing as the finalists. And at that time, the Board of Trustees was wiser, and they chose the right person for the job. <clears throat> and everybody tells me, you know, you lose one, you win one. And they also tell Fadlu, you lose one, you win one. I say we both are winners. But most importantly, congratulations to AUB. Thank you, Fadlu. <laughs> when we send messages to each other, we sign our names, Fad Mu. So if you see a signature from us once by mistake, you know what we are talking about. I am pleased to share with you an important announcement today on this celebratory event, and that AUBMC has commenced planning to establish a genomic center of excellence that would enable our research and diagnostic capabilities to be broadened into a systematic application of genomic tools. In cooperation with a donor that <clears throat> elected not to be named at this stage, uh, AUBMC is undertaking an in-depth study with the assistance of LEK, a consulting company in, uh, in Boston and New York and San Francisco, in fact, it's an international consulting company, to explore and define the modalities, capabilities, and offerings of the Center of Excellence. Once this exercise is complete, completed, which is, by the way, is funded by the donor, we will also engage in a sustainability study to define revenue generation modalities for our research-led efforts into rare genetic diseases in the region through partnerships, as well as pricing and reimbursement for our proposed genomic diagnostics. We plan to broadly offer genomic sequencing options for our oncology patients as we aim to provide the best in-class diagnostic information to our practicing oncologists to align outcomes at AUBMC with those of other leading academic institutions in the USA and Europe through the generation of actionable genetic information. We expect to launch the Genomic Center of Excellence later in the year and aim to be fully operational within 12 to 14 months. We have a task force that is working on this from the various faculty, and we should be hopefully announcing this uh, in the spring of this year. So first, I want to thank the anonymous donor at this time. Hopefully, we'll announce it sometime in May. And thank all of you for attending this important conference. And again, congratulations, AUB. Thank you. Uh, we discovered that Ali Tahir is a poet. So, uh, <laughs> so whenever Dr. Sayer is going to be presented, we'll have some poetry from Ali Tahir. 
uh, how to introduce uh, Fadlu Khouri. I really didn't know uh, how to start and what to do. Then I thought maybe I'll just tell you the history of how it happened. Uh, I was in Vienna in the spring at the St. Gallen Breast Cancer Conference, which moved to Vienna this year. We were presenting a research on BRCA mutations in the Lebanese population. And after the meeting, uh, I went back to the hotel, and I'm in the lobby, <clears throat> and I get this email. Message to the community on AUB's president-elect, March 19, 2015, announcing Fadlu Khouri. And I'm in the lobby, and I say, wow! People started to look at me like this in the lobby. This guy is crazy. So I called Khur, I called Fadlu. He didn't answer, or he was busy. I don't know. Uh, I called uh, uh, Fadlu on his phones, a couple of phones that I had. No answer. Uh, and then, uh, what did I do next? OK. Uh, I sent an email to uh, Rula uh, Ma'awad. I said, Rula, this is the best news you can hear. Fadlu Khouri is the next president of AUB. I said, Fadlu is a wonderful physician, researcher, leader, and friend. I said, this is even more important than the news of president of Lebanon. Uh, I was very excited, so happy. Finally, something good happening in Lebanon. Of course, Rula was very happy. We uh, wrote a small piece on ASCO connection, of course. Uh, uh, myself <coughs> and uh, Paul Bunn, who is sitting with us, were quoted in the magazine of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, <coughs> Fadlo is a man of science, research, and integrity, achievements and advancements, leadership, and excellence, role modeling. Paul Bunn wrote, the American University of Beirut is fortunate to have Fadlo as their new president, and I am sure he will bring the university to new heights. This was an interview in an Nahar with Fadlo. Fadlo has been with us over the years, uh, coming to our uh, Lebanese Society of Medical Oncology and Best of ASCO conferences, and it's really our great pleasure to have him, of course, as president. Fadlo, please. very much, Naji. Sorry I'm going to be brief. I'm talked out. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. I can say, and Key remembers this story very well, that I came very close in 2001 when Kamal Badr, who was the chair of medicine at the time, and Nadim Qurtas, who was the dean of the medical school, uh, to coming back as cancer center director. But I have to say, and it's okay, Nadim is my first cousin, so I can say this, it's the only negotiation in my life where the startup package was going down during the negotiation. So I remember telling Key, is this possibly the way it could work? He said, no. So I was glad to stay at MD Anderson, very happy to move to Emory. And I have to say that I felt I would always come back here. In 2009, when Mo was chosen, I have to say that I was very happy because Tom Morris will recall this conversation from the mid-90s. Uh, many of you may not know this, but I met Tom Morris my first month of medical school in 1985 when he was the president of Pres Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And so I had maintained doggedly that to be world class, AUB had to have a world class researcher at the helm of each school, and especially, and I'm biased, especially the medical school. So when Mo was selected, it was a very easy email to write because, of course, we funded that endowed chair. And for me personally, making a salary, I think he will remember about $108,000 or $110,000. I thought I could get away with giving $500 a month a year or $500 a month, both of which would have been painful. But Dick Debs insisted that for it to be really meaningful, 
a donation should be painful. And so we endowed the Rajan Khuri chair. And I was very touched and happy when Mo took this job. I thought it was perfect. I know Michael was thinking of it as a dean in, in Massachusetts. So we've grown very close over the years because all of us here, and Daji and Ali, I've known 20 years, and I think Kamal and Fouad over 40 years, I think we all love this university, not just because we grew up on its campus, but because we know that for Lebanon and the region to be great and to be equal to any great center in France or the US or anywhere in the world, AUB has to be great and not be regionally great. It has to be truly great. And the only way to do that is to recruit, retain, mentor world-class scientists and physicians. I think the Basile Cancer Center is there. The last step was the recruitment of Hassan Sulah. I had been on the board for I think seven years, I decided it would be better to be on the board of the Basile than be the head of the Basile. And Fadi Jara had done an admiral job as the cancer center director. Uh, and Hassan was supposed to come in as my partner as the head of the International Advisory Committee. But after a few months, Mo, who's very sly and very quick to pick up on people's strengths, noticed that Hassan was possibly the best administrator any of us had ever seen. So he said, well, change of plans. You're going to run the International Advisory Committee on your own because Hassan will need to be the Chief of Staff and then he became the head of St. Jude's and now he's the head of Basile and next thing he'll probably be the head of AUB and still find time to, to keep his wonderful demeanor. And he's one of several examples of the extraordinary people who are populating the Cancer Center and AUB. I think we believe that we don't need to apply the standards that always irritated me growing up. My mother would call it bon pour le proche orient, good for the Middle East. Jean-Charles knows exactly what I'm talking about. That the, some folks here, and I was even asked this question as recently as two days ago by the press, what is the significance of your being the first Lebanese or Lebanese-American person to take the job? I said, I find no significance. It should always be the best person for the job. And I think we've had tremendous people here for a while. I believe that by bringing in some of the greatest translational cancer researchers in the world here today to this symposium and having them mix and discuss and present with our own finest researchers here, is only one step forward. AUB has to be world class. Every day our world class interim provost, Dr. Harajni, refuses to apply any watered down standards to our academic mission. We are done watering down anything. AUB will be world class. It will be one of the world's 100 greatest, 100 greatest universities because the Middle East and the world needs us to step up and be a heavyweight. I believe we can and we will. We've assembled a very strong, very cohesive team. We solve many of the world's problems on Sunday morning at Coffee Mo and I, and then we wait for the world to figure out that we've solved their problems. But we're strong not just in cancer, but in neuroscience and in pediatrics and in so many areas in medicine. And we're actually extraordinary in engineering and, and liberal arts and in health sciences where we just wrote the Lancet series uh, under the leadership of uh, Iman and Wahid about some of the key public health issues in the cancer world. So today is a celebration not of me but of a world-class institution stepping up and taking its place among the greatest institutions in the world. Uh, I can give you an example that when I wrote Ali Bazarbashi's letter for professor, my closing line, at, for his professorship at AUB was he would be a full professor at Emory or anywhere in the world. That's the kind of people we want. That's the standard. I know that our faculty and staff are more than confident and capable of doing it. Now the job is to do it. Thank you very much.
I do want to add my sincere thanks to Ali Tahir and Najee Sahir. They've been very close friends of mine for 20 years since the first time I, my wife dragged me back here, to which I'm infinitely grateful because I hadn't, gone, I hadn't come back in nine and a half years. It was the early 90s. They were both very young faculty. They're still very young faculty. They're now full professor, very young faculty. And, and they and, and, uh, and Nadia and Sheikh, our wonderful associate provost, have worked tirelessly to bring the titans of the world here, including the folks that I've always looked up to, Ki Hong, Paul Bunn, Bob Bast, uh, some of our superstar colleagues and protégés, and my friend for almost maybe more than 30 years, Matthew Myerson, who really is the scientist that my father would have liked me to become. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this. Matthew's father is the great Dr. Meyerson. Mark Meyerson was the president of the University of Pennsylvania. It was transformative, as well as my closest scientific collaborator, Hyam. So today is a feast for me. It's a celebration. I get to be quiet, not talk, and listen to the people at AUB and in the world that I value, revere, and love the most speak. So thank you very much for this wonderful treat. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Fadl. So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Khouri and Dr. Sayer to moderate the next session, which is on academic mentorship. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce my mentor, Ki Hong, who took me as a minusculely published, let's be frank, uh, instructor at MD Anderson. I think my job interview consisted of my making sure I knew the Red Sox batting averages from 1975 and assuring him that if he let me see patients and try to do translational research, that I would do a good job. Uh, he is the, one of the most accomplished aerodigestive or cancer researchers in the world. He's published more than 10 papers in the New England Journal, his first and senior author. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, if I were to list his honors, he would be here till 2 a.m. So he allowed me the pleasure of running his fest shift, which was supposed to be his retirement two years ago, but he still texts and emails me at 5 a.m., so I, I don't know how much he's stepped back. Thank you, Father. I'm just excited uh, to be here to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, Father Kuri's uh, uh, inauguration ceremony. No one is proud of the seeing the tremendous accomplishment of the Father than I am, except uh, uh, perhaps his family. So uh, I thought I should uh, uh, the, go over some story of uh, Fadlo's uh, scientific accomplishment uh, while he was with us. I think many of you uh, really do not uh, know what the, his uh, scientific uh, accomplishment is. So I will uh, walk through uh, briefly uh, what he has done uh, in the past. I had a tremendous fortunate uh, fortune to recruit the father in 1994, uh, right after he finished his uh, fellowship, uh, the oncology hematology at the Tufts New England Medical Center. And uh, he came to our program in 1995 as an instructor. Is uh, I call as a uh, thriving, young, hungry tiger. Okay? And, uh, uh, he came to our program and uh, he really inspired, uh, uh, is galvanized uh, the people's enthusiasm uh, to do some more 
uh, is a sophisticated some tran a translation of research. So the father was a major scientific accomplishment. I can highlight it here. It's uh, uh, the four areas. I will just go over with the briefly uh, what he has done. Uh, we are the one coined the term sort of aerodigestive cancer. It's uh, together lung cancer and head and neck cancer and smoking related uh, disease. It's terrible disease. And uh, we uh, had the opportunity to develop very comprehensive uh, uh, this, uh, the translational research program through peer review uh, mechanism. Uh, PO1 and uh, SPORE okay, is very complicated, uh, is uh, very competitive, and uh, uh, the, this is uh, uh, the team effort, the, the team science, and you can see that uh, it's, uh, many people participated in this uh, uh, comprehensive research project, and father was uh, uh, young assistant professor, but uh, you know, he showed his leadership. Okay? Uh, he also uh, showed his ownership, okay? and also he showed what the, his uh, sense of the responsibility. Okay? Uh, it's, uh, we had to do something uh, exciting, cutting edge research. And uh, the, he did a tremendous amount of work and uh, published a series of the paper very important paper uh, is the uh, first author in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, and uh, another paper published, uh, Cancer Epidemiology Biomarker Journal. Uh, again, it's uh, as a first author. Uh, that means uh, uh, he did all the work, and also he uh, is wrote this <coughs> manuscript by himself. The and then also, at the same time, uh, we developed a similar program uh, focused on lung cancer. And so sort of, uh, biology and prevention of the lung cancer. Again, uh, we developed that program through the peer review mechanism, okay? And uh, uh, U01, U19, P01, and it was highly successful. The father's early work uh, published in clinical cancer research, uh, understanding uh, is uh, the cyclooxygenase pathway uh, in the non small cell lung cancer, and also uh, covering, uncovering uh, retinoid uh, the receptor pathway in non small cell lung cancer. That two important paper uh, led us uh, develop uh, the project. Right. The, uh, this impact of the smoking uh, in the lung cancer and chemo prevention. So the second area, uh, father uh, has made a huge impact. That is uh, the using primary chemotherapy uh, for laryngeal cancer. Uh, this cancer used to be treated by radiation treatment or surgery. And uh, the problem is that obviously sacrificing human voice box, okay? And uh, the father and uh, Dong Shin and the Mary Keys uh, developed uh, primary uh, chemotherapy alone uh, without, the lar without the radiation treatment in early stage of uh, laryngeal cancer. This is a very provocative uh, is a research. You can see that uh, patient listed here, uh, half dozen patients. Uh, lay people here, you can see this is the tumor uh, from the uh, larynx. And uh, uh, this is a nasty tumor. And uh, it was uh, treated with uh, chemotherapy alone and showed, uh, uh, you can see that it's such a dramatic uh, remission and complete remission and achieved about 60, 70 percent. This is the first report, in fact, in, in that regard in terms of primary chemotherapy of the laryngeal cancer. And uh, this paper was uh, published uh, in JCO, and the uh, father was the uh, senior author of uh, 
uh, durable long-term remission with uh, primary chemotherapy alone uh, in uh, stage two and four uh, laryngeal cancer. The third area father uh, has made uh, uh, important contribution uh, is using uh, so-called onyx O1 fiber adenovirus uh, in advanced uh, head and neck cancer. And uh, this paper was a seminal paper and uh, uh, the, uh, published in Nature Medicine uh, in 2000. Uh, in fact, this, uh, uh, the virus was approved uh, by uh, Chinese FDA and now is uh, using uh, in uh, clinical practice in, in mainland China. The perhaps the most important uh, the research project uh, Fadler uh, has contributed is a, a comprehensive DOD lung cancer research program. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, uh, is a huge undertake, uh, tremendous uh, uh, effort uh, through the, uh, this comprehensive translational research project. Uh, the is a precision medicine, that's the goal. And uh, Father was the one brought up the, this idea and then uh, they tackled the U.S. Congress uh, to get uh, a huge fund. Okay, I will show you about that in the next few slides. The best program, a vital program, an impact program, and a battle program, and prospect program. And uh, started in 1997, and uh, this uh, study is still going on at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And again, uh, this is a huge team effort, you can see that, okay? And uh, it's a team science. Uh, it's not your work, it's not my work, this is our work, okay? And this is a concept of the team science, and the father has made a major role uh, in DOD, uh, is supported lung cancer research program. And then I think, uh, uh, that led us to develop the so-called uh, battle uh, the program project and uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has been uh, the highly successful and the uh, biopsy mandated uh, prospective uh, is a precision medicine in non small lung cancer. So uh, look at this amount, the huge grant we brought, over $44 million. Okay? Again, this was initiated, my friend, by father, okay? And uh, uh, we learned a tremendous science from this uh, uh, DOD uh, is a research project. Uh, the, in 2001, uh, the, before he uh, moved to Emory, uh, again, uh, as, uh, the, uh, as a picture taken at the Department of uh, uh, thoracic head and neck medical oncology, and uh, uh, it's a uh, father look a lot younger, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's uh, the uh, and then moved it to uh, it's uh, 2002 to Emory, and then he come back uh, 2010. He was invited by uh, the uh, department faculty to be uh, as a visiting professor. And uh, so the title was uh, Father Kuri Chases Oncogen Addiction from MD Anderson to uh, Emory Winship. And Father was uh, selected uh, as uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Cancer, which is one of the most prestigious journals uh, published by uh, American Cancer Society and uh, still he is editor-in-chief in, in Cancer Journal. And the uh, most prestigious uh, award the father uh, received in his professional career uh, is uh, uh, the ASL Richard and Hinder Rosendahl Memorial Award in 2013. The 2014, uh, the 
I decided to step aside and uh, be semi-retired from MD Anderson and uh, uh, the organized the first shift symposium at MD Anderson August 14. And uh, the person who organized this uh, symposium was uh, Father Kuri. And, uh, and then, in fact, uh, unprecedented, okay, this uh, successful symposium, three MD Anderson past the president attended, Mickey Lemeda and uh, uh, John Mendelson and uh, Ron DiPino. And uh, again, I am so thankful, grateful for uh, this uh, fatherless, uh, uh, the leadership to organizing this uh, successful uh, first shift. So uh, this is my last slide. Okay, why is the father is, so, is making big deal? Okay. And uh, uh, this is an important question. Okay, and uh, uh, so uh, I the uh, been thinking about that. Okay, what's uh, what's the signature of the father Kuri? And uh, so uh, he always worked with the passion, okay, passion, and uh, with commitment. And uh, he treated people with uh, uh, his, uh, with a tremendous faith and uh, loyalty. And uh, he's a wonderful physician, and, uh, <coughs> tremendous, uh, uh, is compassionate physician. And uh, also, he deals with the people with uh, trust and respect. Okay, he he trusts the people, he respects the people, and uh, he and then he's uh, highly, highly innovative. Okay, always uh, think about something out of the box and uh, transparent. Uh, it's uh, no hidden agenda. It's uh, uh, he he come to me and open up the chest and talk about the things of what he thinks is right for the program for the best of science. And again, I say earlier, is is a team player, tremendous team player, and uh, uh, he treated people well, and then he got the respect from people. And uh, and then the uh, is is always a challenging. Challenging is very simple to raise the bar, to incremental progress, to make incremental progress. Okay? And uh, so he's always a challenging. That's the reason uh, he has been so successful. Uh, it's uh, the reached that point as uh, uh, president of uh, uh, his uh, uh, wonderful, prestigious American University of Beirut. So uh, I really uh, congratulate uh, the board of the trustees of AUB uh, the, has uh, made the decision to select uh, Father Kuri as uh, uh, next president of the university. So I am very confident, okay, based on my experience, based on the uh, other people's experience, and uh, uh, the, I have a very good common sense, okay, and. Uh, I think he is going to be highly successful, and I'm very confident uh, he will move AUB to the next level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Key. I'm, I'm very touched. Uh, if we could have, Paul, are you going to give a lecture, or, or are we going to have a panel? Because we had planned a panel. Let's have a panel. Could we have Drs. Hong from MD Anderson, Bunn from the University of Colorado, Denver, Oregon from the University of Wisconsin, and Hamad Harajli, our provost, four exceptional mentors, come and talk a little bit about academic mentorship. And Dean Sayed will, will moderate this session. So uh, maybe first I would like to ask each one of you to make a brief remark on academic mentorship and then we can open it for questions. Is that... Paul, you... Uh, yes. Um, I'd just like to show one slide. If you can okay. put my, uh, my first slide Everybody's, in. We okay, we can do slides. So let's start maybe with oh. Paul. Let's start yes. with Paul. You want to... Go ahead and use the podium, Paul, to show your uh, slide. Oh.
We just need to uh, to uh, catch up a little bit on time. Otherwise, you're going to have yeah, coffee I, break I, I at lunchtime. I know I'm not going to give a talk. Um, uh, I've been very fortunate in my career to have very good um, mentors, and I'm only going to mention one. Uh, when I was at the National Cancer Institute as a, as a young person, uh, Dr. DeVita decided that lung cancer was the leading cause of cancer death and that the National Cancer Institute should do something about it. And so they started a branch uh, to deal with lung cancer, and I was one of the first faculty there. Um, the branch at the time was located at a VA hospital in Washington, D.C., and it was quite striking to me at the time that cigarettes were free for the veterans in the veterans' hospital. Uh, and so uh, my mentor, John Minna, uh, decided that uh, smoking uh, was a bad thing and that the VA, a government institution, should become smoke-free. Uh, and uh, that taught me that thinking outside the box and doing something good uh, would be important. <clears throat> Uh, two years later, uh, the VA hospital uh, was smoke-free, um, and where I work now, the entire uh, campus uh, is smoke-free, uh, and all public buildings uh, are smoke-free. And uh, my only point is uh, pick a mentor that will think outside the box. <clears throat> because the only way to make advances is outside the box. And I show this because uh, one of Fadlow's challenges will be to reduce smoking in Lebanon because I've been impressed uh, that uh, there's quite a bit of smoking here. So uh, choose a mentor, choose widely, and think outside the box. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Well, I think that's, uh, Paul, you're absolutely correct. I think uh, uh, you have to think about something uh, outside of the box and then challenging the questions. So uh, this is sort of the panel for uh, mentorship. So uh, the, the way I feel uh, is uh, I think it's a match, okay, mentor and match, mentor and mentee, okay, is. Uh, uh, it's got to be matched. Okay, there's any mismatch, it's not going to work. Okay, and uh, it's got to be more bilateral. Okay, unilateral mentorship doesn't work. Okay, you try to give us some constructive uh, mentorship, uh, criticism, and the person who receives uh, that advice does not appreciate it, doesn't work. So you throw the ball and one has to know how to catch it, okay? So that's important, okay? Matching and uh, matching the, between the mentor and the mentee. And uh, the other important thing is that uh, you have to have a clear-cut goals, okay? Uh, it's a mentor for what? This is a short-term goal or long-term goal? and short-term goal, and what you are going to achieve the milestones, okay? And uh, so I think it's, uh, it's uh, measuring the progress, uh, uh, it's uh, as uh, the milestone achievement is uh, very important. And then the other third important thing is, uh, is uh, the understanding, okay? Understanding. Mentor has to understand how to feel uh, about the mentee, and the mentee has to understand about what the feeling of the mentor, okay? So I think understand, mutual understanding is a very critical issue. And uh, one other important thing is, as, as a mentor, uh, is to find out the mentee is not doing well, and then find out what is the barriers, okay? There's uh, some professional issue, also personal issue. So you have to understand both, and uh, some professional problems, also at the same time, some personal issue, family issue, okay? So I think, uh, uh, and then you identify some barriers, then uh, the figure out how you can tackle that uh, 
the address of barriers and, uh, uh, and so that uh, you can open up the barriers and, uh, and, and then Menti can, uh, the, uh, to, uh, Menti can be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hamad, you'd like to have a presentation? Yeah. So, to be fair, <clears throat> we wanted uh, Hamad to speak about what? Sure. Five minutes. Sure, sure. Four minutes. To speak about his own mentorship experience. <laughs> five, five, he refused. Five. So he's talking about the AUB mentorship experience. He is one of the best teachers, most decorated teachers at mentor, mentor. So just for the people, Muhammad is actually a professor of civil engineering, and he is now the interim provost at AUB. Thank but you. we welcome engineers here, Muhammad. This is what I wanted to say. Yes. As an engineer, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> But I have a wish in life, is that I stay away from cancer doctors until I die of natural codes. Cancer is a natural. Okay, it's going to be a brief presentation about the academic experience and mentorship. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about the uh, programs and centers and units that promote academic mentoring at AUB outside the classical process of teaching and learning or outside the confinement of the classroom. But before I do that, I want to give a brief, uh, a brief uh, overview about uh, the academic units, about our faculty and our student body at AUB, especially for our honorable guests who are from outside AUB. I'm sure the trustees and the faculty members at AUB available here are aware of this information. We have seven faculties or seven faculties or schools. We have agricultural and food sciences. We have the faculty of arts and sciences. We have engineering and architecture. We have a school of medicine or faculty of medicine. We have the faculty of health sciences, Suleiman Alayan School of Business and the Hariri School of Nursing. We, our programs, our, we have a 50 undergraduate programs and over 70 graduate, pro graduate master programs in the seven units or seven academic units that are presented here. We have nine PhD programs and one medical doctor program. Our student body <laughs> consists of 7,000 undergraduate students with about 25% are international. There we have 1,100 graduate master uh, <coughs> student, 124 PhD, and about 395 students in, uh, in the medical school. 52% of our student body are female, we are lucky, with about two-thirds of the female are in the graduate programs. This is the distribution is shown here. We see that the faculty arts and sciences and the engineering occupy the highest in terms of, highest rank in terms of student enrollment. Uh, the faculty body is composed of 1,040 faculty members with 200 clinical faculty. Uh, over 40% are female. Over 40, uh, they come from 40 different nationalities. And 45% carry dual nationalities. The average student to faculty ratio is about 10, but this varies drastically from one program to another. As I mentioned before, I'm going to talk about institutional mentoring Institutional mentoring, we have many uh, units or programs or centers that support institutional mentoring across AUB. We have a new uh, faculty orientation. I want to talk about each one of them very quickly. We have the Center for Teaching and Learning. We have Center for Civic Engagement and Community Service. We have the Graduate Council. We have the Office of International Program. And we have the Nature Conservation Center. And I might have, I might I may have forgotten some centers that contribute to the institutional mentoring. The overarching objectives of these centers is to try to help faculty and the students to integrate quickly in the university environment and in the Lebanese culture, as well as to help faculty become better teachers, better teachers for more effective learning and teaching and learning. Uh, we uh, try to help to enrich the academic as well as social and cultural experience of students and most importantly, to prepare students to become leaders in their societies and in their communities. Very quickly, the new faculty of orientation, which we do it twice every year for new faculty hires. The program, uh, the program helps faculty uh, to have a smooth transition 
uh, within the AUB community and Lebanon. Uh, it also facilitates a new faculty in integration and engagement. Of course, each faculty member is assigned a mentor in his own department or faculty. Uh, but we still, we still have a problem with this because we have some complaint and we should do better in this area. It's very important. Center for Teaching and Learning, it organizes professional development activities to help all faculty members develop their teaching and educational research skills by conducting seminars. This is what the center does. It supports individual faculty members upon their request. It promotes and shares the scholarship on teaching and learning in higher education. It also plans activities. It has workshops and seminars that enhance student learning uh, excellence. The, so to encourage faculty to, to excel in teaching, the center, uh, the center awards yearly two teaching excellence awards to two faculty members who shows excellence in teaching and learning. Uh, center for Civic Engagement and Community Service. This is a, a, a new center which was established in 2008. Uh, it aims to develop a culture of service and civic leadership within the UB community and to provide opportunity for UB student, faculty and the staff from different disciplines, from different areas or backgrounds to study and respond to pressing challenges. And this is particularly crucial at this point in time where we have the Syrian refugee crisis, and uh, the center is very active in this, in this area. So it has uh, different, uh, uh, you know, it, it undertakes different tasks, community outreach, and very quickly, I'm not going to take time, community-based learning, uh, as well as transformative leadership. The last one is the most important because that center uh, supports uh, scholarship programs that are supported by United States Agency for International Development, as well as the MEPI, MEPI Middle East Partner Initiative and the MasterCard Foundation, these are all federal funds and they require that students acquire leadership skills. So the center is very uh, active in this area. We have also the IT Academic Service Unit, which supports faculty members in integrating technology in the teaching and learning process through two main uh, uh, processes, blend, blended learning, which facilitates the student, 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 faculty, and faculty, faculty interaction in the teaching and learning process, and Moodle service, which provides interactive discussion between among the students and between students and faculty. Nature Conservation Center, this provides a platform for faculty and the students who are, who wants to do research in the area of nature conservation. Uh, it has two awards, uh, it has two uh, activities, EBDA, which is International Biodiversity Day at AUB. Students learn how to work and explore interdisciplinary and innovative approaches in dealing with nature conservation issues. And there is Abel Lama Eco Award where students compete, uh, and in the process when they compete, they will be trained to develop eco-friendly and economically viable business ideas. Graduate Council. I'm going to go very quickly with this. I'm going to skip this. Office of International Program. Uh, it has uh, a mentor program which helps in integrating international students into the AUB Lebanese community. It also facilitates uh, student exchange or, or student abroad. Uh, uh, study abroad, I'm sorry. Study, study abroad, uh, which is. We have, we have, we have uh, exchange agreement with more than 30 universities uh, across the globe, uh, and especially in the United States, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, uh, the UK, Turkey, Japan, and Costa Rica. Also, the OIP mentors, uh, you know, uh, organize on-campus activities as social activities and cultural to try to enrich the, uh, the experience, uh, the educational experience of the international students. Personal perspective. What constitutes a good academic mentor, this is my own personal experience, is the one that takes advantage of available, powerful communications and internet technologies to deliver most effective and efficient means for teaching and learning. I'm sure I'm not as good as myself. I'm not as good as young faculty members in this area. I say it, but I don't do it most of the time. Uh, provides career guidance to students. We have to be there to provide career guidance to students. We need to help them to define their career path in line with their interest in life. We have to display, I display, or we have to display a caring attitude towards the students and listens to their academic and personal concerns, realizing that not all the students are alike. 
they have, they have, they, they, they differ in terms of academic potentials, and we have to deal with this situation. The most important among them is mental health. We have to be able to identify possible student psychological problems. We may try to solve them, but this is not advisable. We have to know how to refer them to, 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 to counseling or advice in this area to solve their mental or social issues. And overall, in general, a good mentor is the one that views students and their broader college experience through a lens that focuses not only on academic, traditional, extracurricular activities, but on the overall student well-being. A good mentor helps you to walk in your own shoes, even if you start out just wanting to walk in theirs. And I can, you know, when you dig the internet, you have tons of articles about mentorship, and we are not reinventing the wheel here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to be pretty quick here. What I was going to do is just give you a couple of things I learned during the time I was the fellowship director at Emory and now that I am the division chief at, at Wisconsin. Um, so I was a fellowship director at Emory for probably about eight years or so, and I think overall it's a great opportunity to mentor the next generation of academic oncologists, which I think really is the role of a fellowship director. Uh, the clinical requirement for hematology and medical oncology, as you all know, is 18 months, and the ACGME encourages scholarly activity, but how it's achieved and how much time should be dedicated is very poorly defined. Um, so when um, I joined, myself and Fadlow were at Emory together, we had uh, fellows that were very clinical in nature. They were really uh, not doing very much research. So what we did was we really focused on protecting time for research. So we focused on trying to get them, encouraging them to pursue basic uh, research endeavors in either basic translation or clinical research for 12 to 18 months. And during that period of time, we really did protect their time by basically, uh, the, with the only clinical requirement they had was just doing one continuity clinic a week, unless the additional clinics were in keeping with their go the goals of their research. Um, we developed a research committee that monitored their research, so they would have to present in front of the committee every six months, and depending on what their progress looked like, we'd either keep them in the research track or we'd move them back into a clinical track. And thankfully, during that time, we did get a training grant, a T32 grant, uh, which is very useful <coughs> in keeping these, pay these fellows on track. Um, so over a period of five years or so, we actually were able to, by protecting their research time, and I believe I was very fortunate because Fadlow actually allowed us to support these fellows financially, we went from having 100% clinical fellows uh, to actually 80 to 100% actually staying in academics, which is a little bit above the national average. So I think that what I learned from this is that you really have to focus on um, making them really want to do research and protecting their time and monitoring them and being there for them. But if you put the time in, it definitely works for these fellows. Um, since I went to Wisconsin, I've been pretty impressed by their assistant professor mentorship. They have a pretty rigid program where the assistant professors are, all have mentorship committees assigned at the start of their faculty position. Um, and then we have this meeting every year where we discuss every assistant professor in the Department of Medicine. And at this meeting, we make all decisions regarding of when their timing for promotion is, any potential track changes are determined. Um, and then the feedback, we give the, the assistant professor the feedback and further steps are defined at that time point. I think that works very well. It keeps people you know, on time for promotion. The interesting thing, however, that I found here, and I'd be interested to hear what the other panel members think about this, is uh, the associate professors are kind of left in limbo, though, because once you get promoted to associate professor, there is no mentorship committee. The progress is assessed by the division chief. So actually, when I got there, there was about 10 associate professors who had been associate professors for like more than a decade. So there was one of them that had been associate professor for 20 years and hadn't really been encouraged to go up for full professorship. So that's something that we're going to try and work on. Um, we do, if possible, encourage them to switch to a tenure, to a tenure position if they've got funding. And um, we are planning on developing pilot grants focused on these mid-career uh, faculty as well. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh
just for the sake of time, I think we're going to move ahead. There is a lunch and coffee break, so people will have the opportunity to ask the speakers any questions. So I'd like to ask Dr. Fuad Ziedi and uh, Dr. Sam Yahuri to come to the podium to chair the next session.